So what I'm going to do is actually I'm going to focus on what you're going to do or we're able to do with this ultra-fast Doppler, the advantages and the workflow now. Now, here we know in the United States, most of us who work in even academics and private practice, but also in academics, we have our chairs try to push us to do more patients per time than anything else. That is because of the reimbursement issues and stuff like that. But also, there's a very important factor here in our practice. Now, if you look at the survey, when they ask patients to go to see their doctors or to go to the clinics, they ask them, what is the most dissatisfaction you receive whenever you go to see your doctor or a radiologist or anything? They put on top number one is how much time they had to wait until they are seen that day. So the second most important thing is the quality of the service, which is something else we're going to talk about. But this is what I'm going to discuss these applications here. Now, I'm going to go qu quick, and as I said, you know, the thing is, what you look at here is you're going to be operating on something that is almost 10 times what you use with the conventional power Doppler or color Doppler that you use in practice. Now, this is what we do on day in, day out, right? Anybody of us who do ultrasound Doppler looking at kidney transplant, like in this instance, or native kidneys, you can see that we do this individually at multiple parts at the same time. The thing is, we have to sample the artery first time in its proximal part, take the sample and then document, take the image, start real time again, sample again, and move on. So that's kind of time consuming, even though you don't feel that, but it's in one way or another time consuming, especially if you do like 10, 15 cases a day of the same thing every day. So now, how does ultrasound fast Doppler? See, this is what you use in practice. You start one part, you sample it, then you scan again, because you don't have that ability to go back and do everything in retrospective fashion the way you, I'm going to show you now. So you sample the inner pole, the lower pole, and the mid pole and the lower pole. And then this is what we do every day. So you're going to do this at one time, take the second part, take the third part, and then document your findings and submit your worksheet to the radiologist who's going to interpret that. But if you have ultra-fast Doppler, what you can do is you can acquire all this data in one. There you go. So what you do is you take a sweep of that kidney vascular anatomy at the same time, and you can go back. And when you go back, you basically go back to pick up the peak systolic velocity, the mean velocity, whatever you like, but we are obligated to go by the peak velocity as it is in practice for conventional Doppler. At the same time, you can pick up all these velocities up to three, one, two, three, and you can place them on the same frame. Now, let's assume I get this image, right, and the patient is gone, and then I really don't like the way this has been taken. I can go back retrospectively, play that video clip again, and adjust the velocity that I want and fix that. Now, that may not be that important in the kidney, but actually it's very important when you do something like carotid exams. So now, the other thing is you can get maximize whatever you like to do, and then in retrospective, you can go and pick up the right velocity where you get nice color vascularity in the kidney that does not overbleed on the image, so you can pick up the most actual velocities you need. And this graph is not like a study or anything, it's just like we sat in the lab and we decided we're gonna just experiment. What is the variation between what we do the old-fashioned way versus using ultra-fast Doppler. And you can see, we noticed that there's not much of a difference if you use ultra-fast Doppler versus the conventional power Doppler. So basically, if we sample the whole thing at the same time, we can actually reproduce almost the same thing, okay? And the thing is, there is not much factor percent variation that would impact how we manage these patients, specifically patients with carotid stenosis. Now, ultra-fast Doppler versus standard color Doppler, you get a lot of data, you get more data, and then the thing is, this is here. You analyze and you quantify and you also can qualitative outcome of what you're doing at the same time, which you can apply to anything you do in the abdomen vascular-wise. So now, where does that clinical application come? You can use it wherever you like, as I said. Carotis is really very handy. You can move patients in and out of your lab and you can retrospectively go back and fix whatever you like to fix about the study. Abdominal vas vascular is really important, and this is really, really, really helpful. I find this in my practice because I see a lot of young kids who we evaluate for unexplained causes of hematuria. When they exhausted everything, they send them to angiography to rule out what we call nutcracker syndrome or something like that. So now we decide to go the other route, being 
more conscientious about radiation effect to our population. And we do the sweep fast in one single breath, and I go back and I look at the vascular and I do my Doppler, and I'll show you examples of that. The other thing, these chronic TIPS patients, liver TIPS, we can go and we can do the same thing. Again, this is really very handy for native kidneys. I would think more than transplant kidneys, why is that? Because patients are breathing all the time, I may not be as cooperative, and you don't have the nice access of a kidney that is sitting immediately under the abdominal wall. I use it for pancreatic transplant, the same problem as well. And this is what I said about pediatric vascular studies. So I don't have much time to show you much examples of everything, but I picked some cases and studies to show that. But the cool thing about this technology is you can sample everything as we mentioned earlier, regardless of the color box size. You know, this is a drawback that we experience with a conventional color Doppler. We have to keep our box as small as possible so that we have the actual frame rate to be able to uh, judge how much is the blood flow going through the vessels we are looking at at the same time. So, and this is the most important thing. You can do this prospectively, but also if you don't like anything, you can go back. It takes you two few more minutes or five minutes, even if you're busy and you don't think that this study has to go out to the clinicians right away because it's not an important finding. You can go back at the end of the day and go over the studies that you did if you're not happy about some of the measurements and you can redo them again. And you can still be within the accurate data that you get when you do pulse wave Doppler. But we know, if I scan a patient today, myself, right, I look at their kidneys, and I go the next day, the other day, and I do the same study, we know that the inter-observer error in ultrasound can go all the way up to 25%. So I don't think we have a much discrepancy between what we're doing here and what we're doing with what we have in a conventional way that we're used to. Now, let's look at this carotid conventional. See, when you do carotid, you have to do the same thing. You have to do the CCA, Velocity measurements, you document that, you do the ICA, you do other parts of the ICA, and then you do your ratios. But look at this nice. This is, you can do this in power Doppler. This is the power Doppler there, but if I go back here to allow this to move, I'll go back again. There. So you can see how you can see everything in real time nicely, then you can see the lumen is filling nicely, and you can move to the next one. And look at this. I am sampling multiple areas within the CCA to the bulb, to the proximal component, and I'm getting my nice velocities and the waveform there, and I can adjust the way I can. Also, you have the adjustment. You can control these things, the baseline, this, uh, this, uh, the PRF, and everything that you can do with the conventional Doppler. Now, and you can do everything the conventional way you do. You can do diameter stenosis the way you want, like you do every day. And you can see that there is a soft plaque over here that you can evaluate the velocities. And despite that soft plaque here, the velocities are still within the normal range and it's not affecting this individual hemodynamically in any way. Again, the same thing is magnified and you can see how nice you can sample everything. And the system will eventually generate for you if you want like a worksheet report of all these velocities for the diagnostic interpretation of your reports. Now, this is the one case that I have from USC. So this is on the new upgrade system, which I find really, really, really a great, great improvement of what I had at Wake Forest, and I tell you why. Look how nice the speaker wave Doppler signal there. There's less distortion, there's little uh, noise in the background of this speaker wave Doppler, and I can manipulate this signal the way I want. I increase my gain, I can manipulate it just like when I'm doing a regular pulse wave Doppler study. Now, look at this case, all right? This is a kidney transplant, all right? So what do we see here is, in this example, you see this cystic structure over here, right? Where initially we think this could be a cyst, but this thing is connecting with this tubular st structure as well, which we know there's some echoes within it, there's a flow inside this. And this is the color of that area. Look how nice you can get that color, but if we go to the next clip, you can see that this thing is communicating with that thing, but at the same time, you have a yin-yang pattern here. So this patient has an intra, or what they call post-transplant immediate intra-biopsy for evaluation of perfusion. 
And unfortunately, what happened is you have this cystic structure here. Now, our purpose of this is to make sure, is this an AV fistula or this is a pseudoaneurysm or a combination of both? And you can see in this instance, you have very low resistance diastolic component going into this, and you start to see some mixing here. So we have a combination of an AV fistula and a pseudoaneurysm at the same time in this patient. So this patient went right away for embolization and intervention as suite, and the angiography confirmed the presence of the pseudoaneurysm and the AV fistula. But look at this. You managed to do all this in one sweep. You don't have to struggle sampling three, four, five images and interpret them separately. You have all the information at the same time handed to you to do that. This is the same patient, and I kept, I kept studying other vessels that are surrounding this to see, look how the low resistance in this kidney suggesting that there's shunting out of this kidney, which also confirms the presence of the AV fistula. Same patient again at different level, and look how nice you can see the tiny, tiny, tiny vascular anatomy without any noise as has been seen earlier. All right, so now, this look, this is a native renal artery. Look at this, this is a beautiful study here where you can see you pick information about the renal artery and the vein at the same time in this patient. You can see the nice respiratory variability in this patient, which tells you that the vein most likely is patent, and you can see a nice waveform in the artery with the little diachronic notch and aerosystolic peak saying that there's no evidence of hemodynamically significant stenosis. Again, all done in one way, one pass, one frame. And you can, if you don't like this, you can go back again and move this cursor up and down the way you want, wherever you want it, within the data that is acquired. There, we did the sampling, multiple, we went back from the same data we got. We got other spectral wave Doppler. All we have to do is just take measurements, take resistive indices, velocities, and generate our report on this case. Again, the same kidney. One sweep, we look at the intrarenal resistive indices. So we can do the RE outside of the kidney, and we can do the resistive indices inside the kidney as well at the same time. And this is what I talked about earlier. This is an eight-year-old kid with hematuria that they couldn't explain what's going on with this kid. And you can see that you are picking all the data at different levels, including the maximum velocity, the peak stalic velocity, the median velocity, and the mean velocity over there. So you have all this information to play with if you want to go back and forth and do your measurements. And there you go. You look at the renal vein is coming. This is a retro aortic renal vein coming here. And you can see it is nicely open and patent due to this respiratory variability, even though you would expect to see if there's something compressing on that, some varicosities in the retroperitoneum in this patient which was not present. So this is the grayscale image of the same thing. So I push on the abdomen, I take one sweep. So I don't have to really bother that little kid multiple time, hold your breath, don't hold your breath, and all, all that stuff that you have to do every day. And there you go again, another clip that I go back and I do think, and there, I did my measurements at, before, behind the aorta, and I don't really saw any change to the waveform, not much variability. We know there's a, a big myth about nutcracker syndrome. A lot of people is, are walking with these renal veins compressed by the SNA against the aorta or compressed against the spine, and they have no other problems. But this is a work in progress that we're working on, or I was working on at Wake, so I hope to be able to continue that at USC. But these are the things that you can, the kids can benefit from. So I couldn't find a cause for this young kid hematuria. But look what did I find at the same time. I looked at the kidney, and I saw a lot of echogenic foci with color comet tail artifact. I put my Doppler signal on multiple areas, and these were stones. So I managed to explain why this young kid have hematuria and doesn't have a nutcracker sy syndrome. So he didn't have to go to angiography or the CT scan like we used to do in the past. So this is peripheral vascular. Here you're looking at the common femoral artery and the patient who had a procedure and he has some swelling in the right groin. And you can see that there is a tiny little pseudoaneurysm coming up at the neck there. And you can look how nice is that. You sample in the artery and at the same time you sample at the neck and you get a little bit of to and fro waveform consistent with a pseudoaneurysm 
secondary to this angiography procedure that the patient had. See, you can go all the way through that, and this is the aneurysm is not really partially clotted or almost completely clotted, but you can see that the waveforms reflect that there's something still going into that. So this patient, despite this thrombosis, he went and he got thrombin injection there to solve the problem. And again, this is what I like to use even in the pelvis, you know? We always look at the ovarian tissue, we always look at the ovarian blood supply for torsion and stuff like that, all right? This is one of my residents who volunteered for that. She was ideal body weight, so this is transabdominal. And look how nice, you can look at the artery and the vein in the same sweep. You prove there's blood flow going to the ovary, you prove that this blood flow going out of the ovary and it's normal size, so you're good to do and make that decision. So additional images of the same thing in the pelvis. So in conclusion, in this short period of time, you can say that it is very accurate measurements across the image. You can reproduce exactly what you get from the pulse Doppler that we are used to individually. But at the same time, if you do a lot of vascular studies and you have a very active vascular service, you can benefit from this to move patients in and out and fast, and you don't have to recall patients. That's what's important nowadays. We try to avoid bringing back patients. The way to avoid bringing back patients, the way we do it, is we keep the patients, we look at the images, and then we release the patients home or we can go to the next appointment. And that takes a lot of time sometimes because you're busy doing other things. But using this, you can go back in retrospect, do whatever you like, get the accurate measurements you need, and that's really a benefit for your workflow at the same time for the patients, and everybody would be satisfied. And thank you for your attention. Thank you.